Number two myth about African men in particular is that they don't give oral sex. They, look, I was taught this in school. African men have dry sex and that they don't care about their partners. They don't wait for their partners to get wet. Um, and they're mean to their women. Um, not tuned into their women's needs and that all African men have large penises. Lord have mercy. <laughs> I just want to say all of that is untrue. All of that is a myth. It's a stereotype. Ask me how I know. <laughs> <laughs>
Don't come here thinking that everybody is going to be darker skin. I blend right on in, in practically every place that I've been in Africa with the exception of North Africa. The next one, number two myth about African men in particular is that they don't give oral sex they look i was taught this in school african men have dry sex and that they don't care about their partners they don't wait for their partners to get wet um and they're mean to their women um not tuned into their women's needs and that all african men have large penises lord have mercy <laughs> i just want to say all of that is untrue all of that is a myth. It's a stereotype. Ask me how I know. <laughs> I don't want to go into detail, but ask me how I know. I have personal references as well as vicarious references. The whole dry sex, not giving oral sex, large penises, don't care about their women. That uh, That's a lie. Number three, moving on. All Africans are poor and starving. Why did they tell us this? That's not true. It's just, it's not true. I don't think it was ever true. You know, Mansa Musa, the most wealthy man on the planet, was African. And now here we are, it's 2023. I gotta tell you, African wealth now, granted, this is like, you know, top 2%. But wealthy Africans, they have wealth on a whole nother level. Like, they have wealth, you know, at the level of what their GDP should be. I'm just saying. I won't go into how they got their wealth because I don't know. Was it ill-gotten? Was it stolen? I won't even go into that, okay? I will just say that wealthy Africans, baby the lifestyle and then also let's talk about middle class africans they live a life of privilege that is beyond what americans experience what middle class americans experience now there's levels to being middle class but i will tell you like you know the average middle class african they have their home or apartment rental in the city perhaps. And then they got land in the village. They have uh, investment properties in tourist areas. You know, the work culture here isn't as strenuous as in the United States. So you actually have time to mix and mingle and socialize with the people you care about during the week. Like, come on. They own their cars outright. They own their homes outright. Their children are in boarding schools. Like, it's, it's on another level. And starving, yes, famine does happen. Droughts do happen. Natural catastrophes, they do happen. Though they are infrequent. And I will also say that famine, that's man-made because there is enough on the planet for everyone to have. When you dig deeper, okay, when you do your research, you'll find out that famine is man-made. But I need to tell you that in most of Africa, you got to try hard to starve because the food falls off the tree. And I, you know, this is just me repeating what my Ugandan sister told me, she was like, you gotta try really hard to starve in Uganda. It's avocados, it's mango, it's what's that other big fruit? Oh my gosh, I can't even think of it. Um, that big, it's a big ugly fruit, like <laughs> soursop they call it in the Caribbean. Just, it's right there. It's not just in people's backyards, it's on the street. Not to mention street food is really, really cheap. Now, is everybody getting all of the nutrients they need? Probably not. 
Moving on. Number four. Okay. All Africans want to escape Africa. And, you know, you hear about, you know, people thinking that the streets are paved with gold in Europe and the Americas. I will say that today, there are so many Africans that are like, I'm cool here. <laughs> like, I'm cool here. You know, development has reached a point where people are really comfortable and they feel like they're part of the larger global conversation and existence. And I would also say that in the heightening of Black Lives Matter, when there was so much media coverage of Black people in America being murdered and hunted down in the streets, Africans, they woke up. They was like, oh, this is what's happening? Oh, no, I'm good right here. And I think so many Africans have relatives, loved ones who are working abroad, who, you know, sometimes give them the real. And you got to think, okay, I'm middle class here in Africa. I'm living a good life here. I want more. I'm frustrated with how things run, but why would I give up what I have to go and suffer in someone else's country? Now, I think that lower class Africans, yes, they can go to America, they can go to Europe and live better lives, stack their cash, et cetera, et cetera. But I think if you're middle class and above, what's the point? unless you're getting some scholarship, unless you have some amazing opportunity. But I've spoken to Africans from all over. They have no desire to leave and live in another country where they're going to be mistreated. Travel, experience, shop, you know, go to concerts, whatever it is they want to experience. Um, business excursions, cool. But to go and live, I'm trying to tell you, a lot of Africans is like, ah, I'm good, fam, I'm good. Number five, this is something that I wanted to showcase when I was an 18-year-old volunteer in Chiretsi, Zimbabwe. I was a volunteer in a refugee camp for Mozambican refugees. I wanted to show people that Africa has cars and Africa has tall buildings. That was like 1990, what, 92? And still, people think that Africans don't have tall buildings and don't have cars. And let me just put this out here. I wanna put this out here. Tall buildings, and gas guzzling, polluting cars is not an indication of success or modernity. We need to rethink that. However, Africa do have cars. Africa do have tall buildings, skyscrapers even, okay? And depending upon where you are, you'll see more or less of that. All I can say to you is if you don't believe it, just Google. I mean, at this point, at this point, it's 2023, y'all. You could watch a YouTube video and watch someone's experience of downtown Nairobi, Lagos, Johannesburg, on and on and on. Before we go on to item number six on the list of smashing African stereotypes, I just want to mention that I have been in Nairobi at the point of shooting this for about two years. And I've learned where to shop, where not to shop. And through Airbnb experiences, you can book an eclectic fashion tour with me. And what I do is I send you a little questionnaire. I ask you what you want to experience what you want to see, and then I curate a custom, a bespoke shopping experience for you in Nairobi. 
through Airbnb experiences. So I just wanted to put that out there because in case you happen to be in Nairobi or are planning to come, please book an experience with me. We'll have a great time. We'll eat good food and you'll get some really beautiful, unique pieces here in Nairobi. All right, all right, all right. Okay, moving on to item number six. All of Africa is hot and dry like a desert. Nairobi, come on. Nairobi is not giving the heat. <laughs> it's not giving the heat that I experienced when I first came here. It's not giving the heat that I would like to have in my life. Nairobi, be it be jive like cold. I'm not even going front. And for me, cold is like 50 degrees. Who comes to Africa to wear jackets, to wear sweaters? But you know, some people like it. Some people like it. Southern Africa is cool. Botswana, South Africa, Zimbabwe, higher elevation Africa, Rwanda, Nairobi, closer to higher altitudes, it's cool, sometimes downright cold. Some places you get snow. West Africa, I'm pretty sure West Africa is hot year round. North Africa, also cooler, okay, especially at night. East Africa sometimes can get cool as well. Addis Ababa, I was in Addis, Addis cool as well. And let's not think that all of Africa is dry. We have tropical rainforests here. We have oceans here. We have microclimates here. So in some areas, you have a lot of humidity. I was just on the coast in Lamu. Lots of humidity. Edge control, forget about it. Let's <laughs> just forget about it. Okay. My skin always just moist, glistening. The moment I flew one hour, landed in Nairobi, skin dry, okay? So let's just nip all that in the bud. All of Africa is not hot and dry. Okay, moving on to number seven. All of Africa is a jungle. I think we get that from Tarzan movies. I think we get that from movies. I think we also get it from National Geographic as well. You know, in my eighth grade junior high school class, geography class, I had a very racist teacher who did not want me in his classroom. And he made that known. He was a piss poor teacher and obviously a piss poor human. The only time we watched a film the whole year, the only time we watched a film was when it was time to cover Africa. We had covered the whole rest of the world and he saved Africa for last. So this man shows a film and it's these people, smaller people, and I don't even remember what part of Africa, is, but they were naked. They had paint all over their bodies and they were running through a tropical rainforest yelling. I don't remember. I don't know what they were yelling. It wasn't translated to us. There was no context given. My... 13, 14 year old self was like, okay, this is a special ceremony. This is not what people do every day. But the message was sent. And the message was, this is Africa and these are Africans. The teacher did not give any context. He did not explain anything. He simply turned the film off and we were to sit there and marinate in that. My white student sitting next to me, he turned and looked at me and he said, those are your people. Message sent. And I was looking like, 
Okay, and what? And what? <laughs> because clearly in the United States, you can find the same thing. Football day, oh my God. Americans and football, it's 40 degrees outside, 30 degrees outside, okay? Fahrenheit. And you got white boys with their shirts off, paint all over their body, all over their face. They chanting, they singing, they drunk, okay? Whether the team win or lose, they flipping over cars. Come on now. Now, if somebody was to take that image and put it out into the world, without any context and say, those are Americans. Those are white people. We would all think they were savages. Okay, so let me just say this. Africa has deserts. Africa has tropical rainforests. I prefer to use that rather than jungle. Africa has savanna, plains, cities, mountains, all of that. This notion that all of Africa is a jungle is ridiculous. And uh, let me just put this out there. Um, some people just want to hold on to those stereotypes, regardless of all the information to the contrary, because I'm very active on Instagram. All right. And my homegirl, I love her. She is a good person. But honestly, after two years of living in Africa and showcasing my Africa from the beach, the beaches in Zanzibar, the villages in Zanzibar, towns in Zanzibar, to the, the Nile and the towns and cities in Uganda, this girlfriend on the phone was like, I, I don't even know, um, like, where are you living? I mean, are you in a hut? Do you have electricity? Boo. I'm showcasing everything that I'm experiencing from fancy resorts to small cottages. Why are you asking me this stupidity? Why? Even if I was the only person you followed in Africa, why are you asking me that stupidity? And, and why are we on it? We don't just have mud homes. And even if we did, let me just say there's technology. Our ancestors knew what they was doing. There is technology in earthen homes, adobe homes. See, we like to use those words like earthen and adobe when we're describing homes that are made from the earth in the West. But in Africa, it's a hut. Come on, y'all. Let's, let's do better. Moving on. Stereotype number eight. People have elephants in their backyards. What? Elephants in your backyard? You know, there are some very fortunate people whose property is expansive and it stretches out into national parks and they get to see wildebeests and giraffes and elephants and the occasional lion, kudos, all of that. Those people are blessed and those people are rare. Animals really don't like living around humans because humans are destructive, we're loud, we tend to, uh, we're predators. Shit, we're predators. That's just it. Um, when I was in the 10th grade in a new school in Burbank, California, first day, there was one other black kid in the whole school, although they didn't identify as black or even African. But my homie, one of my best friends, Ethiopian. We didn't know each other then. It was my first day. And I saw the other students picking on him. These white boys picking on him, sticking pencils in his hair because they were just in awe that a pencil would stick in his hair. And they were questioning him. You have elephants in your backyard? This friend came to the United States when he was eight years old. 
and they were teasing him, but they were also genuinely curious. Do you have elephants in your backyard? He was like, no, he was from the city, Addis. Why? Let's get that out of our heads. Now, I, what I will tell you is sometimes we do have monkeys in the city, and I love that. So you can think about monkeys like you think about squirrels, okay? They're typically not out and about again because humans, <laughs> cars, you know what I'm saying? They mind a business typically, but I love when the monkeys come and visit in my courtyard. They eat the fruit again. Food just grows on the trees. We got pow pow, and this is an apartment complex. We have mango, some other fruit I've never heard of, but the kids <laughs> and the monkeys seem to like it. On and on. But listen, in cities, you're typically not going to find wildlife. And if you do, it's like in the wee hours of the morning, you know, and they do have migratory patterns. Moving on. Number nine, African women have natural hair. All, or I should say all African women have natural hair. It's just not the case. Um, back in the day, I was made fun of for having a baldy. Uh, I remember having these ridiculously long braids, went to the barber shop to have them cut them off. I wanted a little fro. The barber refused to cut my hair short. You know, I've been, you know, people thought I was a lesbian because I've had short hair. You know, people wanted to know why I wouldn't straighten my hair. All of that. I will say that the standards of beauty are pretty ubiquitous across the globe. The more proximate you are to whiteness, the better in most circumstances. And so in regards to our hair, the looser the curl, the straighter it is, the longer it is, the more desirable. And so don't come here thinking that all African women will have natural hair. They won't. All Africans do not even value natural hair. They just don't. We can go into that in another video, but I'll just leave that right there. Number 10, Africans are ugly. <laughs> Again, I think we get this from media. Mm. Just think about every time you've seen an African on television or in a movie. One note, just one note told from a non-African perspective. I will tell you, when I went to Uganda, I was like, oh, they lied to us. They lied to us. And also, being light-skinned is overrated. And I would say that to other African-Americans especially the men who were in Uganda, I would say to them, they lied to us, didn't they? And yeah. They know exactly when I say, when I say they lied to us, African-Americans, they know exactly what I mean. Because we were taught that we were somehow better than Africans because we're in America. If they had left us there and not stolen us from Africa, we would be starving. <laughs> we would be in filth, surrounded by flies, et cetera, et cetera. And there's this notion that, you know, the more European ancestry you have, the better looking you are. That's a lie. That's a whole lie. You can YouTube, you can Google beautiful African women, beautiful Rondis, beautiful Uganda women. And, you know, and let's just not focus on the women here. I'm a heterosexual woman. Oh, my God. The beauty, okay, in the African men that I've seen from one tip of the continent to the next, from east to west, come on now. I'm going to just leave that right just leave that right there 
Okay, uh, number 11. African languages sound like gibberish. Hooga booga booga. Where, again, National Geographic bullshit, media, that's where I got that from. Because every African language that I've heard has just sounded so beautiful. And it's nuanced. I'm here in East Africa, so I let me just speak about Luganda, which is a language that's spoken in the central region of Uganda. It's like poetry. It's so beautiful. When you hear, when you hear Africans speak their native languages, it's like, oh, I don't know what you said, but I know what you said. It's beautiful. And then when they speak English, it also sounds so melodic. It's like when my friends in Uganda, when they talk to me, it's just like, Dre, oh my goodness, Dre, come, just come. Like they sing when they speak. That's not, of course, it's not from coast to coast, but I will just say that African languages are not harsh and the bullshit that has been stuffed down our throats with the shit that we've received through media, this is just not it. I belong to Agape Spiritual Center that is based in California and I'll, I'll just call him our pastor or spiritual leader, Michael Beckwith. He would often have one of the parishioners from Ghana come up to the pulpit and speak her native language. I can't remember if it, if it was Twi or Ga, but she would come up and she would just like read the announcements. Nobody could understand her, okay? But he just loved the way it sounded. <laughs> and I liked it too. I, girls, talk, talk your shit. And then she would go into English, right? Listen, that stereotype, not true. Okay, number 12, all Africans like spicy food. I have to admit, I believe this. I believed it because I lived in Washington, D.C. for 13 years. There's a lot of West Africans in D.C., First generation Africans in the DMV area, all that food be spicy, okay? Heavy, heavy with spice. So I came to East Africa and I was like, oh, you know, in Zanzibar, lots of spices, okay? Mm. Outside of Tanzania, Ugandans really don't like spice. Kenyans don't like spice like that. Rondis, they do have like this little spicy oil that they use. But for the most part, it's not a lot of spice. To let you know how little spice people use, typically, I went to a vision board party. Bunch of women in a room for hours creating their vision boards. Afterwards, we get up to tell people this is what this is our vision for ourselves this kenyan woman gets up and she has on her vision board chilies spicy chilies she's like this year i want to try spice i want to try chilies girl i was like for real and then i met someone else from east africa and I made the assumption, because after being here now, I know they don't really like spice like that. So I made the assumption that she didn't really like spicy foods. She was like, oh no, oh no. My father made sure that we ate spice. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> okay, sis. So, you know, not all Africans like spicy food, okay? And last, but not least, Africans don't have fine arts, literature, poetry, etc. That's a whole lot. That's a whole lot. Again, media. 
And this isn't, this doesn't just pertain to Africans. The assumption is that the global north is the center of the world, wherever you're from. In the United States, we think we are the center of the world. So we don't even realize that there are poets and writers of all genres in the global south. We don't realize it, particularly for Africa. It's not even something you even consider. My mom was dating this white American dude. She was about to marry him, okay? He dated nothing but black women exclusively, black American women. And I remember him making a comment that African Americans didn't have theater. And I was like, where is that coming from? Well, you guys don't have theater. What? So if you don't think that African Americans don't have a rich history of theater, imagine what they think about Africans. Ponte. There's a bookstore that I love going to in Nairobi. It's called Cheche Books. And there's African authors from all over the continent. And authors throughout the diaspora, all up and through there. We have libraries here. We have archives here. I mean, and this is just one country, one city. <laughs> okay. As far as poetry, forget about it. We have a rich history of poetry in Africa. Fine arts, visual arts, stop it. We have museums here. We have artists here that are self-taught and classically trained, right? My mom and, and myself, we were taking art classes at what is it called? The Nairobi Art Center and then plays. There are plays here every week. And even outside of the cities, you can find people engaged in theater in the villages. <laughs> These notions, look, just whatever you were taught about a people, just throw it out the window until you can experience it yourself. And if you're not able to experience it yourself, we got Google, y'all. Okay? This ain't the 80s and before. We have computers in the palms of our hands. Use them. That's it with the stereotypes, y'all. I want to thank you so much for joining me on this episode of Black to Africa. May you thrive. May you be inspired. May you move with love and intention. Until next time.